Okay, so welcome everybody and thank you for joining our webinar today um, here at Quantum, uh, where we're really excited to be launching the Mountbatten Tutor, the latest uh, edition of, of the Mountbatten Brailler. Um, today uh, we've got a number of presenters, Peter Cracknell, who's our um, education lead and vision technology specialist based in Queensland, will be um, doing the main presentation and demonstration of the Mountbatten Tutor. But we've also got some very special guests. Um, for many of you, Tim Connell will need a little introduction. He was the founding um, director of uh, Quantum and former CEO and was instrumental in the, uh, the beginnings of the Mountbatten and throughout uh, much of its history. Uh, we've also got Trevor Boyd, who will be familiar to many of you, particularly if you're in Victoria, South Australia or Western Australia, who um, for many years as, um, was our blindness specialist there. We've got Karen Knight, who's the General Manager of Client Services for Vision Australia, and also Tricia Deputy OAM from NextSense, it's the RIDBC, and who's the lead consultant for vision impairment there. So I'll just do, a, and I'm Rebecca Cott. So, um, here in New South Wales. So I'll just do my brief introduction and then um, I'll hand over to Tim first of all, so just a moment. So first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which this webinar is being presented and pay our respects to any elders past and present. And um, for me, that's the Darug people of the Eora Nation. Um, just a little bit of webinar housekeeping for anybody that might not have been to one of our webinars. Your microphone will be muted during the webinar, but we'll do have a, a time for questions at the end. Um, and if you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A area or the chat. For keyboard users, you can get there using Alt and H or Command H, I believe, if you're a Mac user. And if you've got any technical difficulties, you can also put them in the chat and we'll be monitoring that. And we are recording the webinar and we'll make it available afterwards um, via email and our YouTube channel. Um, so just a bit of an overview of today. So first of all, Tim Connell will be giving us a bit about the Mountbatten story. So um, to give us a bit of background, Trevor Boyd will be talking about how here at Quantum we support the Mountbatten in schools and also parents. Tricia will be talking about early braille learning and how families can get involved with that. Um, and Karen Knight will be talking about braille and her career um, and how it's been instrumental in um, helping throughout academic life and um, into her career. And then Peter Cracknell will be doing the main presentation and demonstration. And then we'll have a question and answer and we'll probably go for about an hour and a half all up. Um, so, oops. So without further ado, I shall hand over to Tim, who, as I said, was our founding director and um, instrumental in the beginnings of the Mountbatten. So welcome back, Tim. Thank you very much, Becky. And um, when uh, Peter asked if I would come along today and um, talk a bit about the beginning of the Mountbatten, um, he said I had 10 minutes and I thought, well, uh, he doesn't know me very well because I could talk for hours about the Mountbatten. <laughs> Um, I will keep it to 10 minutes and I'll start right at the beginning, which is um, uh, why it's Mountbatten. Um, it was Lord Mountbatten and it was his uh, assassination by the IRA that started the whole process. And um, he was a real technology expert, uh, aficionado. Um, if you ever go to his house, which is called Broadlands in England, it's full of all the, the stuff of which he was championing and, and using. And his family felt it was a, a fitting tribute to um, donate some money to, to the Mountbatten Memorial Trust um, to develop a, a new piece of technology. And you have to think that this was in the late 70s, early 80s. This was at the time, the emergence of, of personal computing, um, incredible amount of excitement within the blindness community because of, of that transition from mechanical devices to electronic devices and, and the early DOS computers and Apple computers all talked. And so there was, it was really a, 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 the peak of that transition period when, when people were thinking about what's, what's next in technology. And um, 
that's really where the Mountbatten uh, came from, which was this idea that um, we, we need a new generation. Not that there was anything wrong with the old generation, but um, it, it was uh, time to keep Braille up, up to speed with what was happening in the rest of the world. Um, it was also at a time when education, when uh, was education of children with disabilities was moving into mainstream. Um, and that was pre presenting a whole lot of new challenges too about how um, other people could interact in Braille, how the student could work in Braille and, and so forth. So there was a big, big expectation that technology would fill some of, some of that gap. Um, the Mountbatten Memorial Trust um, gave some money to the Royal National College for the Blind in England. And under the direction of uh, a young engineer called Ernest Bate, they developed it um, to a prototype stage and they realized it was viable. Um, and the aim was to make a, a electronic braille writer. And uh, at that time, they then said, well, if this is gonna work, we need someone to manufacture it. And um, they put a, um, a call out for people interested around the world. Um, and we were one of many who, who responded about um, being interested in manufacturing it. They also, at that point, did something that was probably the best thing they, they could have done and the worst thing. Um, and that was that they asked everybody in the world um, what should be in the Mountbatten Broiler. And um, so we inherited, we, we won the tender and we inherited this thing, but there was an expectation that um, the device was going to be able to meet the needs of everybody. And there, was, there were literally just about every blindness organization in the world, hundreds of individuals all responded about what they wanted. And top of the list was an easy to use electronic braille rider. Um, they wanted connectivity. They wanted to be able to interact with the other devices that are, that are around. Um, they wanted translation. Um, they wanted graphics, they wanted a whole lot of stuff. And then when we got it, we were able to introduce some of our proprietary knowledge around Braille translation, which made working with keyboards, working with printers, working with computers, all possible. Um, and a process that we thought was gonna take 12 months, took three years um, before we actually launched the product in, in early 1990. Um, and over the period, I think we had moderate success in, in positioning the Mountbatten Braille in the right, right spot. Um, it never has never achieved the, uh, the mass market of the mechanical Braille riders. And, um, so it had always remained a sort of a, an expensive item. And um, in some ways, it found a natural home in early education, that this was a device that, that young children could, could easily um, interact with. The, the keyboard was very easy to use, it had speech feedback and so forth. And that's where it's, it's been. Um, I've always felt that the Mountbatten had, had um, a lot more potential um, uh, being a device, a personal device in, used throughout life for, for writing, for embossing and, and so forth. Um, and I think that's part of the excitement I feel about seeing this, this next generation. Um, in about 2000, we did a, we, we, were, we never could understand really why it had such low, low penetration. Um, and in about the year 2000, we did a survey in the US um, and we asked all the APH ex officio trustees, who are the people that sort of control the money and a lot of the, the influence in the education market. And we asked several thousand teachers, vision impaired teachers, teachers of the vision impaired. Um, of that, we found only 30% of them were even aware of the Mountbatten. Um, we also found that about 70% of them felt that um, the Perkins or mechanical Braille writer wasn't necessarily the best first tool uh, for early education for kids to be able to really interact. Um, and that the, the, the typical um, 
age of braille engagement was much later for a, a, a child who is blind than a, the, the literacy engagement was later for a child who is blind than a, a, a sighted child. And so we redeveloped it again and we introduced um, a whole lot of more features. We introduced the talking calculator, we introduced the, the, spe the uh, music synthesizer um, and, co and more connectivity to a range of different devices. And, um, and that's where it's, it's been for, for, for the last few years. And um, I still think it's, it's uh, just a, a wonderful product. Um, I think it's got a lot more potential and um, for me, it's been particularly um, gratifying to see Harpo continue to develop it. In one sense, this, this version of the Mount Batman that's coming out now um, probably should have come out 15 years ago. Um, but it's the nature of the, the market in, in Braille technology that um, there's not a lot of people investing in it. So um, the, the gains that we make are, are typically fairly uh, small and fairly slow um, with braille writing. Obviously, we're seeing lots of other technology developments, but the actual art of braille writing, especially for early education, has been fairly slow to, to develop. Um, but uh, we are seeing now um, an evolution, and uh, in one sense, it's, it's going uh, back to the roots of when we first started, which was we had small braille embosses and we had um, devices like the braille and speak and so forth. And, and uh, to have now the device that's both of these things and can really uh, work with the, the student from the very earliest stages of, of mark making through to a tool that they'll use right through their life, um, I think is, is very, very exciting. So. Um, I think I'm coming up for 10 minutes, so uh, I know I'll get cut off if I keep wafting on. So I'll leave it at that and, and, and hopefully uh, can answer some questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Tim. I would never, I wouldn't cut you off, but <laughs> 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 thank you for that. That was a great um, introduction and uh, history of the Braille. So um, we'll now have um, Trevor Boyd, who was our Braille specialist for uh, many years and talk about um, supporting the Mountbatten and how he's handing the baton over the baton over to uh, some of the rest of us on the on the team here at Quantum. So, <laughs> oh, <thanks laughs> welcome, very much. Trevor. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Um, yeah, look, I I think one of the key things with the Mountbatten, I think, it always pays to remember that the Mountbatten is a developing tool, um, and it always has been. And one of the crucial things with that is just to, to look at this tool um, that does quite a lot in terms of what it can do um, and work out what's appropriate. And one of the key things I found with supporting it was just visiting the schools, sitting down with the VTs and the aides and the students often, and just working out, you know, what, what is this need that they would have right now? Is it early intervention? Is it, is it learning the Braille? Is it... Um, Braille production, is it, you know, the daily notes, all those sorts of things. Um, one of the key things I, I found was that to do with a statewide visiting race, um, statewide school, basically, that had all the VTs that were out there supporting kids. Um, we used to run a basically training sessions two or three times a year. The VTs used to come in, a lot of the aides used to come in. Um, and they were great sessions, they really were. One of the things that uh, fascinated me was one time we did this sort of survey at the end and said, what would you like the Mountbatten to do differently? What, what's the story? What would you like? What's something new it could do? And we came up with 11 good points of, uh, you know, changes. And one of the fantastic things was to go back to our software guys because it was all in-house at this stage. And I think the next year when we ran a similar training thing, they'd actually implemented 10 of the 11 um, uh, suggestions, if you like, the way the processes. So I think there was a really good feeling about the Mount Battens. Um, and I know at one stage, uh, uh, I'm not sure I was told that every barrel using student in a public school was using a Mount Batten uh, in their basically academic life either early interventions or brow production in high school. Um, 
all of these sorts of things. So basically, if to summarise, if you want to look after the, the people and make sure they're supported well, uh, the training sessions, I think that's far easier now with Zooms. Um, and you can actually sort out a lot of issues very quickly and immediately just with a good, uh, with, you know, the, with the technology now. Um, we used to have issues with NBN and other sorts of um, continuity issues, but all that seems to be pretty solved within schools. Um, and that, that sort of immediate support pays off. Uh, I found it worked also very well in WA. Uh, I did a lot of support students over there with Rob um, for quite a while, uh, same with Northern Territory. And I actually had involvement with uh, over in New Zealand with some of their schools, visiting some of their, or working with their VTs and training services over there. And again, it's the support um, has always been very good, I felt, uh, across quantum uh, for teachers where they just uh, could ring up and get information. Um, the thing that's happened, I think, lately, which has been very good is with uh, NDIS uh, supporting uh, Mountbatten's and things at home with parents. That's been really uh, an enjoyable process. I've had a lot of very positive feedback with that. Uh, and I think some of the newer aspects of the Mountbatten really do lend themselves to that early intervention. And I think, to some extent, fill the gap as well that... Um, you know, parents can be far more involved with what's going on. Uh, and just it's just been, I've got a lot of requests for simple things like the recipes and um, just daily things around the house so that they can engage with, with kids with Braille more often and more easily. Um, yeah, that's about it. I found that the summary is just the supporting has been so critical with this um, to ensure that people are using it in the right way, basically for the for the best purpose and the rest will grow. So thank you for that. Thanks, Trevor. And yeah, we've now got um, Leon and, and Stuart down in Victoria looking after people down there and um, Peter and I supporting them as they, uh, they're getting to grips with all the Braille and supporting people down there. So uh, yeah, and we've got Megan in South Australia and Northern Territory now. So. Yeah, <laughs> gradually, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, well, thank you very much, Trevor. Um, we've now got um, Tricia to uh, talk to us about um, early braille learning. Um, that's an area of expertise. So thank you, Tricia. I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Rebecca. Um, what I'd like to talk about is just children and literacy. Now, these children could be sighted, they might be blind, they might have low vision, but just children in general and how they acquire literacy. Most little kids have had a go at tablets. They've had a go at an iPad or mum or dad's iPhone, etc. So they're really familiar with some technology. But I want to get you to pretend to go into a classroom, depending on which state you're in. It's either prep, kindy or foundation. When you go into that classroom, you will see very similar things that you saw 10, 15 years ago. Children have lots of pencils, they've got lots of paper, and they learn the foundations of literacy with hard copy, be that hard copy print or hard copy braille. And reading teachers in schools start off with the concepts of print. I'm going to change that phrase slightly to the concepts of text. So it's print and Braille. So teachers need to let children know that whatever's on the paper, be it print or bumpy writing, that it conveys a message. Then the kids learn which way to turn the book, which way to, um, the reading goes. It goes from left to right, top to bottom, etc. Then they learn that letters have sounds, letters make words, words make sentences, and they learn that there are spaces between different things and there's different punctuation. The process for any child is usually the same for both reading and writing. 
young babies start with shared breathing. It's beautiful bonding time. It doesn't have, matter if they're um, sighted or not, not sighted. They're sitting there with a parent on the couch, all snuggled up, possibly a sibling, and they're developing a love of literature. And this isn't happening at the beginning of school. It's happening when they're three to six months old. And with things such as the Felix Library, these children get a chance to feel bumpy writing and tactile graphics. So after you've got shared reading at school, you start with the big book, and that's modelled reading. The kids are sitting around, the teacher's reading the text, modelling how to read. The kids are going up and putting their hands on the text and blocking out little bits and saying this is a word and this is a full stop, etc. And then in early reading, um, it's the guided reading process uh, where the children are in little groups and they discuss the text and they predict, etc. All of these aspects of learning literacy are in hard copy. And that's hard copy print or hard copy braille. Um, the classrooms of these schools are very rich in print. You only have to look around the classroom and see this wonderful stuff on the walls, et cetera. Even on the playgrounds, they're, you know, doing hopscotch and, you know, the walls are painted with the alphabet, et cetera. And it's possible to replicate that and bring it to a child who is a touch reader. That can be put in a special little book near them so that um, if they want to, the teacher alerts them to something that's on the wall in print, they can go to the page that's got the uh, replica in Braille. Um, so the foundations of literacy are in hard copy. I just want to tell you the story about two students that I've had in the past that were not hard copy learners. Both of them were audio readers um, and one of them had learned to touch type quite young. And when he was typing and writing stories, he used the word had to, H-A-B-T-U. He was saying, ah, everything, every oh, tense word was had to. And if you looked at what he was actually writing, he was saying, I have to go to school, then I have to unpack my lunchbox, then I have to do this, and then I have to do that. He didn't know the word have and to were two different words. And he didn't know that have was H-A-V, not B, E, and to was T-O, not T-U. So he had not had the opportunity to learn in hard copy. There was another young man who loved sheens. He loved playing with sheens. He loved looking at what sheens can do and sheens couldn't do and there were big sheens and little sheens and tall sheens and small sheens. What this young man hadn't done was seen the word machine written. He hadn't seen it in print, nor had he felt it in Braille. He was unaware that the word machine started with M. He thought they were all called sheens. Now, he, he, if he got much older, he was going to get ridiculed for not knowing that that word started with M. People who don't learn to read hard copy tend to have terrible problems with spelling. This is a generalisation. And punctuation. And those are the important foundations for concepts of text. So be it print, be it braille, be it low vision, hard copy is the way to become a literate young child. Choices can be made later on in the uh, educational journey, but to acquire literacy is to use hard copy. Thanks, Rebecca. Oh. Thank you so much, Tricia. Yeah, it's such important points and um, yeah, really value your, your contribution and thanks for being with us today. So um, we'll now hear from Karen Knight, who, as I said, was the General Manager for Client Services at Vision Australia, but also a Braille reader herself. So she's going to talk to us about how, how she uses Braille and has done in the past. So thanks, Karen. Thanks, Rebecca. 
I really believe that the greatest gift given to me was to become a competent Braille user from early childhood. The support, encouragement and teaching from skilled teachers and supportive family have really been invaluable in my life journey. So when I finished school as a competent Braille reader, I went to university and I went, I've been to university for three different degrees over three different eras from the 80s to the 90s and um, they're just finishing my final MBA uh, about four years ago. So in that time, technology changed dramatically, but what didn't change was my use of Braille. And for me, even though there's many times in life that you cannot get ready access to materials in Braille, your ability to create the Braille yourself is so important. So for me, all my notes were in Braille through university. All I requested examinations in Braille. And whenever I wanted to understand how something was spelt, it was Braille that I always went to. For me, Braille has been incredibly important in my professional journey. I qualified as a psychologist and through my work as a psychologist, making notes and accessing materials has been critical to have Braille. Whenever I have to do presentations, I like to have hard copy Braille. I obviously use electronic media a lot of the time in my job, but for me, always having access to a Braille display is so important. When proofreading documents, if you're not accessing Braille, you really don't understand how a document is laid out. And you, it is much harder to actually be able to deliver high quality work. Listening to Trisha's story, I can relate to the stories about spelling. And for me, when I had to use electronic media a lot more in my later uh, professional journey, I noticed that my own spelling had deteriorated. So I had to really focus on in building that capacity again. I always use Braille in my uh, day-to-day -day life, every single day I touch Braille in so many ways. I always prefer recipes in Braille. I like to have lots of reading material in Braille. While there's many ways that you can get audio material, it's not quite the same as going to bed with a Braille book. So f for me, the, the gift of Braille is, has been an amazing addition to my life. And I really feel passionate that if you don't give someone that opportunity, you're really denying them reaching their full potential. There's quite a lot of research to suggest that for people who are blind or low vision that can actually use Braille well as their major medium, that their educational and employment outcomes are better. So I think into the future, we must ensure that Braille is maintained for young children who are blind. And we must also ensure that adults who lose their sight are encouraged to learn Braille. It is a ticket to independence and we absolutely know that it is, is the way that you can be truly literate. If you can't read print, then Braille is the only way that you can be truly literate. So I am a passionate advocate for Braille 
and I really encourage all of you to use every tool at your disposal, including this um, this uh, newer product here, to bring about the benefits that Braille can have for the lives of people who are blind. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks so much, Karen. It's great to have an an, an insight and yes. Yeah, as we, yeah, stressing the importance of Braille because I, I know it does get asked a lot or occasionally, you know, is Braille still needed? And obviously the answer is, is yes. Um, so now I shall hand over to Peter. So we'll have the, to demonstrate and present this new generation of the Mountbatten. So thanks, Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, and thank you very much to all the other panelists. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's been, a, I think, a very wonderful introduction to uh, the, the basic importance of, of these devices and the Braille, Braille being a modern and uh, fundamental uh, literacy. So uh, my job is to uh, really show you the new device and compare it to the older devices and other devices as well. Um, and I'm just going to do that partly with a PowerPoint presentation and then partly by actually putting the camera onto the device and showing you some of the features. So let me just share my screen. Rebecca, can you see that slide? I guess I can, yeah. Oh, Thanks, great, Peter. okay. So um, on this first slide, we have um, a picture of the classic Perkins in the bottom left corner um, and a Mountbatten Whisperer in the middle and to the right, the new Mountbatten Tutor. Um, so what is the Mountbatten Tutor? I'm just gonna advance that slide. Um, well, it's the latest version of the Mount Bratton Braille series that Quantum designed and manufactured from 1990, uh, and now, of course, being manufactured by Harpo Adaptive Technology in Poland. So like its predecessors, it's an electronic Braille writer with speech output. Its principal use is in education and early Braille learning, though, of course, it can be used in, in other scenarios as well. It can be used as a Braille embosser. But essentially, it extends the well-established usages of the Mountbatten LS and the Mountbatten Whisperer by adding more connectivity. And above all, by making it uh, more intuitive for non-specialists to use. So by including regular classroom teachers and teacher aides and parents, people who are not Braille teachers can still assist in the early learning stages, both at home and at school. So complementing the work done by, by Braille specialists. So to understand uh, what the Mountbatten Tutor is, uh, we need to compare it to previous models and also to the Perkins Braille. Now the Perkins Braille, of course, was an absolutely revolutionary device back in the 1950s and certainly even more liberating than, and I have a picture on the slide here of an Underwood typewriter which in itself was a revolutionary device, uh, but the, the impact of the Perkins as a Braille writing tool just can't be un underestimated. And it's still the primary device used worldwide for Braille writing. And I imagine, I think uh, Tim, I'd be correct in saying that it's still the main device used in Australia for learning Braille. Um, so it might seem a bit anachronistic that blind people might continue to use a mechanical device. But of course, we shouldn't ever forget that everybody uses some well-trusted old-fashioned devices, of pen and paper, for example. That's been around forever and sighted people use that still. And in fact, many blind people refer to the, the Perkins as pen and paper. It works extremely well for people who already know Braille and it's tough and it needs warning every couple of years. And the question is, I guess, why would we need anything more? And of course, Tim and uh, Tricia have already addressed some of those, those points. I'd, 
I'm just going to focus on the shortcomings for early Braille learners of the Perkins, not because I want to put down the Perkins, but simply because it will contrast with the advantages of the electronic Brailler. So first of all, of course, the Perkins is Braille only output. And that means that if it is pen and paper for blind people, it's essentially using invisible ink. It's invisible to everybody that can't read Braille, which of course is most people. The, sec the second point is that being mechanical, it takes a lot of strength to press the keys down. And that's just a function of being a mechanical device. And the other feature of course is that early learners need a professional Braille teacher to sit with them whilst they are learning. So just looking at the, um, the first point, and here's a picture now of the Mountbatten Tutor with a few other peripheral devices around it. The, the Mountbatten Tutor, in a sense, makes Braille visible and audible. The Braille that the child is typing can be back translated to print, either on the built-in display and on the picture there on the, the right hand side, there is a LCD display that's built into the new Mountbatten Tutor. And for people who are familiar with the older versions, there was a separate display called the Mimic that did much the same thing. But the, the Braille can also be saved electronically as a digital file on a USB stick, and then obviously reproduced in print on a print on a computer. We can in fact print to a regular printer and we can transmit to regular devices like iPads and computers and have them displayed on those devices as well. So this way, people who are not Braille specialists can participate in the process. On the second point about the strength to press the keys on a Perkins, on the Mountbatten and for the whole range, but also on the Tutor, there's a very soft action for the, for the keys. Uh, so that means that you don't need a lot of strength to, 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 to form the Braille. And in the photograph I have on the slide, uh, you may notice that the keyboard, which is called a wireless keyboard, is detached from the Mountbatten Tutor. It's actually wireless. It can be positioned anywhere. And that opens up possibilities for people who have postural problems. Uh, perhaps uh, they're in a wheelchair or they may have other issues which require them to adjust the position of the keyboard. Of course, it should always be close to the Mountbatten Tutor so you can reach over and feel, feel the Braille, of course. And uh, the Mountbatten Tutor also has a, uh, a one-handed mode as well. So for children that can only use one hand, it is possible to, to use it in one-handed mode as well. On the third point about learning uh, and requiring a professional Braille teacher at, at the point of learning, with the Mountbatten Tutor, of course, um, because a sighted parent or a teacher aide uh, can read the, the display, they could perhaps have it connected to their iPad. They, and the, of course, the tutor itself is speaking out loud as the child is brailing this can make it possible for them to contribute to that learning process. So um, this way, people at home, families can con contribute with spelling and quizzes and games and all those sorts of things. The sort of fun, engaging things that will be parallel to the, the more formal Braille instruction provided by VTs and so on. I just need to be clear though, of course, that this is not ever going to be a replacement for that formal process. We, we absolutely see that the, the tutor fits in as part of a, a whole ecosystem of uh, teachers, Braille teachers, parents, and, and so on. Um, obviously, formal instruction is absolutely necessary, but the Mountbatten tutor can contribute at home and, and also in the classroom where perhaps the, the Braille instructor is not there and that we only have teacher rates and regular classroom teachers. So I'm just going to, I've brought up a slide which is just showing the Mountbatten Tutor 
um, in comparison to the previous model, which was the Mountbatten Whisperer. And for those of you that can see the slide, the Mountbatten Whisperer has the traditional uh, keyboard layout built into the case, whereas the Mountbatten Tutor has, uh, as I mentioned before, the detachable keyboard. So the first obvious thing is that the, the Mountbatten Tutor looks a lot more sleek, shiny, modern, looks perhaps more like a regular printer compared to the, the Mountbatten uh, the Mount Patton Whisperer. I, I have also mentioned that at the top of the slide that the commands are backward compatible. And what I mean by that is that all of the formatting commands that were present in the Mount Patton Whisperer have been ported straight into the tutor. And that means that teachers that are already familiar with some of those formatting commands uh, and some of the processes, uh, they're all still available exactly as they were but they have actually been grouped and aggregated in the menu system that is brand new to the Mountbatten Tudor. The, um, the, the internals of the Mountbatten Tudor are all re, reworked. So the emphasis was on reliability um, and reducing the need for servicing. Now, for example, the battery is a lithium ion battery instead of the old lead acid batteries that were in the, were in the Mount Batten. Uh, this was always one of the issues with the older Mount Battens was that on school holidays, people would forget to keep them on charge. And when they came back from school, they would have a dead Mount Batten um, and the battery would have to be replaced. So the parts, the batteries and, and so on, they're all much more reliable and require less maintenance in the Mountbatten Tudor. The other thing that's absolutely brand new in the Mountbatten Tudor is that it has windows underlying the, uh, as the operating system. Now, though it's not being used in the way that you or I would understand windows for running programs and so on, it's being used to provide the connection, the connectivity. So we've got USB ports, um, we've got uh, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. Uh, so all of those things are possible because Windows and all the drivers and so on are, are there within the system. I've already mentioned the detachable keyboard. So that's the point of difference to the Whisperer and the previous models. And I touched on the, the menu system. Now, the menu system, as I said, it aggregates all the, the commands and so on that were in, in the, uh, the Whisperer into logical groups. So there's a section for forward translation, a section for back translation, for page layout, uh, and so on. Uh, right margin bell commands, all those sorts of things are now in a, a vertical list, which is displayed on the display. And to move through that, um, through that list, we use this new idea of uh, an, an arrow key system, which was on a circular dial. And I'll be demonstrating that when I turn the camera there, which allows you to just use an up and down motion and a, and a confirm button to move through the menus. The main idea there, of course, is that someone who's not can't remember all the commands, they could simply hunt down through the menus for something that looked approximately to do with that, and then explore that sub menu and find the, the command that they need. And that's all, of course, voiced, it's all spoken out loud. The visual display is built in, though we can also connect to other displays as well. And I'm talking about iPads and computers and so on. Of course, uh, for anybody that's not familiar with Braille, uh, all Braille devices do make noise, um, and so does the, the Mountbatten Tutor. I would say that compar in comparison to the, the previous model, the Mountbatten Whisperer, uh, it is about the same about the same uh, level of, uh, of Braille embossing volume, maybe a little less. Uh, so uh, that's that is an advantage in a classroom situation. And finally, the uh, the Mountbatten Tutor has got some new games as learning tools. These are mostly vocabulary games and quizzes. Uh, and 
also some improvements to the the uh, the calendar function and so on. There's also the music keyboard, and I'll be mentioning some of those things a bit later on. Well, I might as well mention them now. <laughs> the diary and calendar have been vastly improved. The diary was already present in the whisper in previous models and it was a way where a child could just um, uh, put down uh, uh, you know day-to-day -day, uh, events and so on but because the uh, Mountbatten tutor can connect via Wi-Fi to Google Calendar it now means that somebody that doesn't understand Braille or anything like that they can have a shared Google Calendar and something that mum puts in on the Google calendar an event like don't forget your swimming togs or Sarah's birthday or whatever, um, they will get embedded straight into the Braille, uh, the Braille version within the Mountbatten tutor, which can be read and read out loud as the child moves through it using the arrow keys. It can also be embossed, of course. So this way, the child can participate and take some management of those uh, of their of their time management, uh, their, uh, the concept of the future, planning, and so on. And I think that's a very exciting ancillary benefit. So it's not so much about braille there; it's more about being part, taking some ownership and, and some management and autonomy. The other th thing that has been improved is the tactile graphics. So uh, we've always had the ability with the mount buttons to type braille that looks like some shapes and angles and so on. And so you can make pictures of teddy bears and flowers and so on. Um, but by connecting the mount button tutor to a computer, we can use programs like Picture Braille and QuickTac. And QuickTac is free. It's a free drawing program to easily create simple tactile diagrams and then transmit them via USB to the Mountbatten tutor, which will emboss them. And those tactiles can incorporate Braille as well. So they could be labeled and annotated. And the other fun thing is the music keyboard. So you can actually use the eight keys of the, of the, uh, the wireless keyboard to, for, to form an octave. And you can change the pitch, the instrument, and the duration of the notes and so on. And it is also possible to type in the beginnings of Braille music. So you can type Braille, Braille music code in, record it as a file, emboss it and so on. Uh, and we will also in, in the future be able to play that back um, using the instrumentation that we had selected earlier on. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the camera to the device and go through just some of the, the basic operations uh, of the, the mount button. I'm going to stop sharing now so that we can switch to the camera that Michael Palmer's on. Thanks, Peter. And uh, I'm going to come around now and Hopefully people can mostly see the video of the mount button there. So let me know if your view's not right. Can you see that okay, Rebecca? Yes, I can. Okay, so the device is about the same weight as the previous mount button. In fact, um, Michael, if you can turn the camera to the to the left, we have the, the mount button whisperer over there, um, which is uh, a oh. bit wider. Sorry, sorry. Peter, some people are saying they can't see. I think that I'll spotlight the video. Maybe that will help. Looks like we're okay. okay. Good. Yeah, we should be good. Okay. Great. And so that's the amount. I've got it standing upright, uh, but it's it is uh, wider and a little bit heavier than the mount pattern tutor. And just coming back now to the the tutor itself, you can see that the casing is completely different. Completely different. And um, the first thing I'm going to just talk about is the, the paper handling. Now, this is exactly the same as it was on the previous model. We do have an additional reading tray, which just fits at the back here. 
into the slot. And that just gives a little bit of reading platform, uh, just a, a nice firm surface there. Um, the paper feeds in the, in the usual way. There's a paper lever, uh, which we pull up as in the previous model, and you can either feed it from the back or from the top. Once it has loaded, it takes a measurement. And um, I'll just mention, of course, that we're talking here about just regular paper. This is just um, ATGSM uh, photocopy paper. And you can even use stuff, recycled paper. So if you've got any paper that knocking around, you can use that as well. And that will save on cost, of course. Um, the wireless keyboard, I'm just going to just give a little bit of a description of it for you. So one of the things that we've done with the, the keyboard here com in comparison to the previous model is the keys are laid out more like in a computer. So we have an escape key in the top left and underneath that a tab key. And on the other side, on the right, we have the backspace key in the top right and below it, the enter key. And of course that is the same on a computer keyboard. We then have eight keys. Now two of them we're not really using here in Australia, that's dot seven and dot eight. Of course the mount pattern is sold everywhere. So um, that's more, more relevant to eight dot braille countries. And then of course the six keys, uh, one through six in the middle, a space bar underneath. And that's a point of difference with the, uh, the previous model where that had an, an enter, sorry, a new line, and uh, and a space bar and, and an enter key. Here we just have the space bar and the enter key in the usual position. And we have below this, this innovation, which uh, we call the click pad. And this has got an up and a down arrow. So if I press the up arrow, it moves the paper. Or if I'm in the visual display, it'll move up, up one line. If I press the right arrow, if I had braille there, it would move through the braille. And in the middle of this arrow key system, we have got a confirm key or what would have been called the command key. So that also can function like an enter key when you're confirming a command and so on. And finally, we have a dial within the arrow keys, which is just for fast movement through the menus and so on. So I think what I'll do is I'll just, um, oh, I should mention that as you bring it up towards the case, it actually starts the charging process of the detachable keyboard. And that does that through the case. It's just a, a magnetic clip and a, a wireless uh, charging through there. So let me just uh, show you how we can just browse some stuff here. So, so let's say I do, so it says dot six, I'm using the capital sign there. And then I'll do. So that said capital D space do, and this, this is the same as on the previous model in the sense that it's actually giving you the, in speech, the contraction as well. So I've just typed and the child could read there. They've also got the reinforcements of the speech. Now let's say I wanted to correct that. I could just use the left arrow key on the, on the, uh, on the dial pad and I could move back through the, and Michael, if you can just show on the display here, we've also now showing here two lines. We're showing the expanded um, braille. And above it, we're showing the ASCII equivalent that includes the contractions and so on. So if I go back, and let's say I want to uh, correct the, the, the C to something else, as in the previous model, I would press the backspace key in combination with the key that I want it to produce. So I'm going to do that now. And so now we like bats. Uh, so that's th that's much the same as on the previous model, but of course we now have on the display here the the correction dynamically changing to show that there. 
Okay, so that's, um, that's the simple operation there. What I'm going to do now is just to show you how we can connect a regular keyboard and do much the same thing here. So this can just be a regular USB keyboard. I just plug it into one of the USB ports. So here we just, the child could just type in normal on normal QWERTY keyboard. And this way, I think this can be extremely useful where the child is also learning QWERTY as well. They get the same audible benefits and the braille feedback as well. Uh, so uh, they, could, they could be learning in parallel QWERTY as well as the, the six dot uh, braille input there. Now, one of the um, one of the nice things about the the Mountbatten, of course, is that it also has um, some games in it. Uh, so I'm just going to show you one of those games. And while I'm doing, while I'm uh, going to get to that point, you'll see how I can use the menu here. So the first option in the menu is File, and I can go down the menu with the down arrow. And of course, in the forward translation settings, we would have things uh, like the grade that's being used, grade two, grade one, and so on, uh, where the forward translation is happening at all. In other words, when we're using the, the, the QWERTY keyboard, whether it's going to translate uh, or not. Back settings. And back translation, the reverse process. And with the speech, we can change whether it speaks the words, the lines, or the letters. Keyboard. In keyboard, we can actually switch to one-handed mode. This is where the calendar is. Games. And finally, this is where the games is. So I'm going to go into games, and I'm going to use the confirm key to do that. And the one I'm going to do is the letter relay race. It gives you a description if you want to. I'm just going to go diving in and start the game. Start game. Select number of players. Now, it could be three players, or in this case, I'm going to select one player because I want to play against the Mountbatten Tutor. One. Enter name and player number one. Oh, okay. Check the in the well, it is, so let me just put in me. Now I've done that in grade one. So it's um, it's actually embossed the first question or the first word, and on the display it's also written that word out in 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 print. And the game is to look at the last letter of the word, in this case an E on the word pi, and then I have to think of a word that starts with E. So I'll just do that. And so I checked that and it ends in T. And so I'll do, um, what do I do? I'll just do T. What about uh, tutor? <laughs> oh, what a good idea. <laughs> I won. <laughs> okay. Well done. So, look, you can uh, you can set the level of difficulty and so on, um, and the amount of rounds. But I think that just gives an example of just how engaging that is, and how that could be something that will really get a child engaged mm -hmm. with the process and and working with their parents and and siblings and so on. So, and new games are being added. Uh, we're 
we are in touch with Harpo to add new games in. Uh, if anybody has any games or ideas for games, please do let us know because we would certainly consider that. I think it's a very important area. Um, now, the other thing I'm going to show you is I'm going to just going to show you how we can connect to the iPad as we used to with the, the previous model. Uh, the program, the app that you can download for iPad, and it's also available for Android as well, is the Mimic, MB Mimic app. And so the, for those of you that are not familiar with this, uh, look, it's a free app that you can download from the App Store. And you basically connect the Mount Batten. It looks for any Mount Battens in the vicinity. Here it's found the MBT. And hopefully that will Bluetooth connect. It says it's connected. I'll just check that UEB is on. And I have some options here. I can go to the whiteboard or to chat. Now chat is just like a, a back and forth messaging. I'm just gonna to go to whiteboard. And this is where I think a lot of the power and, and, and uh, uh, of the Mount Batten Tutor comes in is that parents and regular classroom teachers can use just conventional iPads and so on to start this process of voc vocab lists, of vocab lists, quizzes and so on. So let's say uh, the teacher says something like, uh, you know, what's the, um, the capital of, say the capital of Hungary. So then we have uh, here on Braille the, the question and then the child can type back on the on the Braille display. So they could do, uh, what have we got? And so then we have uh, the answer there like that. And this can be just a back and forth or it could be something that uh, had been uh, something copied from the clipboard, pasted into the whiteboard, it'd be embossed, and then the child could could add and, and back and forth. All of this can be saved as files in the iPad. Uh, we can also share from some apps directly into the whiteboard as well. The other thing um, I've mentioned is that uh, we can use sticky braille labels. So this can be either in the, the thicker sort or the, the thinner sort, uh, like here. And that of course then opens up the labeling of the child's objects, but also their readers and so on. So uh, mum could just cut out um, the, the text for this or the teacher could do that, the, the regular teacher could do that. They could label their CDs and, and so on. And then uh, just to, to show an example of some of the tactile that we produce on the Mount Batten Tudor. So this was drawn with QuickTac, which is the, the drawing program uh, for Windows. And uh, so that's, I've just actually run a little bit of uh, ink over it just so you can see the dots a bit clearer. Um, and so you can make all sorts of shapes and so on uh, very easily with the drawing programs. So I think that gives you an idea of how easy the tutor is to use and how quickly you can get some great engagement uh, with children. So I'll go back to the PowerPoint now and just to talk a little bit about pricing and funding and all, all that sort of thing. Thanks, Peter. Um, and also just to mention, I think Peter did at the beginning was you can also connect to um, it. You can still use MB comms, although there's a newer version and um, the same for if you're actually using a Mac computer. Um, so. Okay, so I'm just going to share my screen again. Okay, yeah. I might unpin you then. Lovely. Okay, you can see that? Uh, I can, uh, yes. Okay, so just to talk about uh, the, uh, the cost. So the Mountbatten Tutor is 7,460. 
and that compares to the Mount Batten Whisperer at 6,970. And I did put in also that the, the Perkins is 2,100 just to just to give a to give a, an, a comparison indication there. Um, now, some families might be tempted to think, consider electronic braille note takers and and braille displays because they're about the same price point. Uh, so then that may be absolutely right for some for some children, but you've obviously got to consider whether they're right for electronic braille. Trish, you made a very strong case and uh, for paper braille and uh, for the importance of getting getting to grips with the page, the page layout. Um, so it's that's a very subtle question that needs to be addressed is when to introduce electronic braille displays, electronic braille note takers. I would just say in this context for very early braille learning uh, that uh, the, the Mount Batten has those strong advantages of the, uh, the sense of the page layout, the, the being able to produce paper braille and so on. And we can't really get that directly with the electronic braille displays. And of course that introduces another whole level of complexity of coming to grips with the operating system of the braille note taker or, or the computer that it's, it's connected to. So in the long run, of course, we'd hope that, you know, all students would engage with those, uh, with those devices at the, at the appropriate time. Um, but we, we think that the Mount Batten Tudors lay some of those solid foundations for before they move on to the more complex digital environments. So um, one of the questions we had uh, from prior to the prior to the uh, talk today was about NDIS, and so I just want to talk a little bit about that. It's certainly been very important for for us uh, being able to uh, offer the Mountbatten series through NDIS. Uh, it's, I think, very well suited to NDIS funding, and we've certainly sold quite a few through uh, NDIS applications. So the important point is, of course, that Mountbatten Tutor, being such an expensive device, will require an assistive technology report, and that's usually done by an occupational therapist or an adaptive technology specialist, and that's a, you know, a proper comparative report which is arguing about the benefits to the child of, uh, of using a Mountbatten tutor. Um, I think that there are some very clear arguments for it in, in that space for use at home, uh, for foundational reading and spatial awareness. And, and when I'm talking about spatial awareness, I'm partly talking about the page, but I'm also talking about tactile graphics. Uh, for example, one could download a, a, a map tactile through the Mountbatten Tutor and do some early mapping. And these are important foundational skills. Uh, introduction to music and uh, digital competency. So I think that those arguments are quite clear. Uh, the, the other thing I would say is that it is a family friendly device and it connects to regular devices at home. So I think once again, that's a very strong argument for its use at home. We have to be careful about uh, how the educational advantages are framed. Obviously, one wouldn't say that it was, you know, it was something that was um, being used in the school environment in an NDIS application because they're separate domains. So you have to be very clear that it's for the the home learning environment that the, the Mount Patton tutor is being applied for. That's not to say, of course, that you couldn't mention that it will reinforce learning at school. There may already be Mount Battens at school and because they are completely compatible, so the same command structures, the same learning curve, that will reinforce the argument for the Mount Batten tutor for, for use at both home and at school. Um, so I think in, in closing my presentation, it, it's a bit hard to sum up neatly what the Mountbatten Tudor is because it does so many things and it will mean different things to different families, different, every child is different. Uh, we've come up, the closest we can have as a tagline is currently families learning Braille together. Uh, uh, though that you know ignores many of the other benefits around music and tactiles and time management and so on. I think it does emphasize 
that the learning is not just a school thing and that Braille can be for everybody, uh, everybody in the family, and it can be fun. Um, so hopefully you've seen that some of those, those fun, engaging things today. I'm um, going to stop sharing and hand back to Rebecca and I'm sure there, there may be some questions from the floor. Uh, thanks, Peter. So, yes, we'll take any questions. We have got one in the chat. Um, so, that asked, how do we go about trialling this um, for clients? So, um, Peter, I don't know if you want to answer that or I can. Um, yeah. Yeah, we can. We, mm -hmm. So, um, we can do yes, that, so yeah. We, we can do that. When, when we have stock, <laughs> mm -hmm. we, we're still yeah. waiting on the... the, the, the there's been some shipments delays uh, at the moment, unfortunately. Um, but in March, we'll certainly be able to get out, meet people and demonstrate it and trial it with people and so on. So as we do for all of our products, so whether that's at our facilities um, or in schools and homes. Absolutely. Thanks, um, Peter. And yeah, we had another question. Um, I'll just, uh, how do you carry it? It does actually come with a, um, a bag. I don't know whether oh, I meant to say before, thank you to Mike, who's um, our Gold Coast Low Vision consultant, who's been acting as camera person today. Um, so yes, it comes with a nice backpack uh, that you can carry it in and it's not too heavy. Um, yeah, between learning environments at school, it's, oh, I can't remember how many kilos it is, but a couple of kilos, maybe? Uh, it's it's four, 3.9 kilos. Four kilos. Okay. Yeah, 3 .9. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's probably maybe a little bit similar to the old one, a little bit lighter, perhaps. Um, measurements, I have to get our website up. It's around... Uh, we'll have uh, to... It's probably about... What, 40 centimetres long, maybe? Roughly? Yes, I'll, I'll have to bring up the... Um, the uh... Yeah, it's, it's I'll, less... I'll take that on notice. I'll go and Okay, we'll take that on notice. We'll get the exact <laughs> detail, sorry. Um, and does it have a calculator? Okay. So the Mountbatten Tutor does have a calculator and it does have a scientific calculator. Uh, the only issue is that currently it's Nemeth code. So, which is not the code we use here in, in Australia. So one of the projects we have, a long-term project is to have that UEB uh, code for, for mathematics and for the, for the calculator. Um, so I, I haven't mentioned it because uh, I, I would love for it to be, to say it's UEB, but it, it still is not UEB. And that of course will be an issue for how children learn numbers and op operators and so on. So um, I, I haven't talked about that today. Sorry, Beck, we can't hear you. Sorry, um, somebody's asked, uh, is there an upgrade program? And oh, does it have a handle? It does sort of have a little handle at the back, but not that you'd really carry it. I haven't tried carrying it with the handle. Um, yes. Have you, Peter? Yes, yes, it's fine. It's quite a sturdy, uh, um, sturdy yeah. handle. Yeah. Cool. yeah, so, um, yeah, it's just at the back, on the back edge. Um, can you lock the settings? Can you lock the settings? Oh, I see what you mean, yes. So You can save um, them, but... Yeah. Um, you, you can save and restore settings. So uh, that's one way of recovering. And if somebody accidentally goes in and um, stuffs them up, mm -hmm. um, I don't think we have a lock as in the way on the previous model where you could lock out the command key and that sort of thing. Um, but I will check that. And certainly I think it's a, it would be a valuable thing to do so that a child wouldn't accidentally issue a command. Mm, yeah. Um, oh, can you show us, a, somebody's asked, can you show us a music editor on it? Um, not really, but I would love to show that to you, you know, at another time. Um, yeah, maybe we can but The music do that editor in is, um, at the moment, you can type the Braille code in, and it's only single line, so it's not chords. Um, and you can record that as a file. 
and that that's recorded as a, what, a BMF file. But um, at the moment, it's not voicing those. You can't play it back uh, with mm -hmm. the with the with the uh, audio. Um, but you can edit it, and uh, you can you can uh, you know correct that and so on. So that's still a work in progress for the voicing of it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and Nina's asked, can I write a speech on a plane on the iPad and then connect the printer later to emboss? Yes, you would be able to do that. It, um, that's a function of the Mimic. You can share share files from the iPad as long as it's sort of a text file. So. Yeah, or with, with the MB Com program, you could, uh, which is on the Windows, you could uh, transmit mm. files as if you were using it as an embosser. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's great. Um, I think there might be one more question on the Q and A. Oh no, we've done. Oh, somebody did ask, if, yeah, if we've got an upgrade program to trade it in for older ones. Um, we hadn't got anything set up at this stage, but I guess talk to your local person and we can perhaps see what we can. Mm. Do is that? Um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll we, take we that have, on notice we'll, as well. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, we're, still, we're still working it out. We're still building the aeroplane. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, somebody's asked us if you can watch the webinar at a later date. Yes, it is being recorded, so um, we'll get the that out to everybody. You should get an automated um, email after afterwards. But uh, yeah. Um, might be about a week after. Um, yeah, Rebecca, it. it might be nice to hear if any of the other panelists have any comments or having seen that presentation now. Yes. Does anybody have any uh, any comments? Well, just a, a thank you, Peter, for a great presentation, and and um, thanks to all the other panelists and and to all the people attending for the the, uh, the kind words and encouragement. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim, and thank you. Um, and yes, thank you very much to all our panelists, Karen, Tricia, Trevor, and Tim. It's been great to, to have you on here and hear your uh, your story. So, yeah, and thank you, Peter and Mike. <laughs> and I'd yeah. like, just like to make a special thank you to, to Trish. Thank you so much mm. for your work over the last month, um, looking through the documentation, um, testing the features, giving us such great advice. I, I really appreciate your help over the last mm. month. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. I totally echo that. Really appreciate the, the feedback. And, yeah. Okay. Well, I think, yeah, if that's it for questions, um, we'll leave it there. So, oh, I will, sorry, I'll put up our um, contact information. So if anybody is looking at having a demo or... Um, or you know, has more questions about it, then uh, you by all means contact us. So it's um, 1300 883 853 or info at quantumrlv.com.au. Um, we will, we are produce, starting to produce resources and things on it for the website. So, um, or have its own separate little website. So um, watch this space on that. So thank you everybody. Um, what do you see? Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, okay.